I just talk about something, a, a contradiction that I see in the understanding of Sunni Muslims and the way that they interpret what is in the Bible. So, the Quran never actually mentions in any verse that the Bible or the Torah is corrupt. As best as I can see, the Quran issues a warning to those who would claim to write down something that was not of God, then claim it was of God, and then sell it for a sum. Because the Quran will then tell you that they've received their reward for doing that. So there's a warning against this stuff. Okay, so you cannot forge scripture. That's great, that's fine. Now, Surah 5, verse 48, I believe, tells the Christians that they have nothing to stand upon unless they believe in the gospel and what Allah has revealed therein. So apparently, as of the reveal of that ayah or that verse, we as Christians are supposed to follow the Injil, which as we know now, we've already established that this is an interpolation taken from Evangelion in Greek, which refers to the good news of Jesus Christ. So, what we have here now is we've established that the Quran is making reference to a pre-existing source text or a message called the Gospel. The Quran, as you've also heard, comes many hundreds of years after Jesus and his disciples and the original writings of the disciples. Now, in the mind of a Sunni Muslim, if they are taking corruption to mean that there has been a systematic attempt throughout the entire Christian world, through the ages, to in some capacity alter the source text or the core teachings of Jesus, they would have to prove this. And here is what makes it funny and is the main topic of this video. With the Quran, when you read it, it is very short. It's about four fifths the length of the New Testament. So, if you try to condense the entire Bible down from the Old Testament all the way to the New, and then Revelations even, down to a piece of text or a collection of texts that are only four fifths the size of the New Testament, then you're clearly going to miss out some steps, miss out some very key information, and miss out some very key doctrinal and even salvific uh, bits of scripture. So, the Quran, I believe in Surah Al-Ma'idah, says something to the effect of that it has come to confirm some of what was previously revealed, but disregarding much of what was revealed. So in the Quran, it is an understanding that the Torah and the Injil, as well as the Quran, are all authoritative, but are sent to different communities. Now, very clearly, modern Muslims don't hold this view. They claim corruption on such a scale that the original teaching of Christ has been lost forever. However, they hold that it has been preserved in the Quran. My issue is this. If supposedly the Quran is the Mohammed or the Furqan, whatever you want to call it, the protector or the criterion, why is it so lacking in detail? Take, for example, Surah 38, Surah Sad. In it, you have the story of David being met by the two individuals who uh, come with him uh, um, with a story that uh, one of them had 99 sheep, the other had one, and the one with the 99 stole the one from, from the uh, owner who only had one sheep, killed it as soon as his guest, and asked David to judge between them. This is clearly copying from Second Samuel, where the exact same thing occurs, except this time it's an allegorized of understanding from Nathan who comes to David and informs him that because of what he has done with Uriah the Hittite, he has effectively been that one shepherd with nice nice sheep, aka with many, who has now taken from the shepherd with the one, aka Uriah and, and, and his wife. Now, when the Quran makes this reference, it gives a corrupted, in my personal view, understanding of what the story actually is. It turns it from an allegory into a literalized retelling. But then, in the Quran, David asks for forgiveness, mirroring what happens in 2 Samuel. However, in the Quran, it never explicitly tells you why David asks for forgiveness. Because in the Quranic story, all that happens, forgive me, I don't have reference for you, but it's in Surah 38. All that happens is that David judges among the two assailants who come into his home. And he judges correctly in that he says that the one that had many and gave the many uh, and, and, uh, and took the one from the one who had the few is incorrect. But in that instance in the Quran, it then says that David 
asking forgiveness. And he fell to the floor asking forgiveness from Allah. So somehow in his judgment, which seemed just, he had done something incorrect. And the Quran doesn't tell you what that thing is. But the Bible does. He's asking for forgiveness for the transgression that he has done against Uriah. So if the Quran or is, is, uh, is true in the Sunni understanding and the Bible is corrupt, how would we ever understand what David was asking for forgiveness for when seemingly he judged rightly between an unjust man and a righteous man? Well, if you go to, for example, uh, the two Jalals and look at their tafsir on, on this uh, on this ayah in Surah 38, they will make reference actually to the Bible. They, they will say that, that perhaps it was that woman that caused him to sin, aka talking about, um, I believe it was uh, the wife of, the wife of Uriah, I believe it was that she might be wrong about that, but I'll just get that off again. But effectively, even the uh, their famous exegetes, the two Jalals, will refer back to the Bible in order to understand Quranic stories. And this would have been the same case when Muhammad was supposedly alive and randomly uttering these surahs for 12 years in Mecca when there's no evidence of actually being any Christians in Mecca in the time of Muhammad. How do we know this? Wherever you have Christian communities, you will have a church building associated with them. For example, in the time of Muhammad or even before that, in the in the 500s, we know that in the north of Arabia, you had the Jassanids and the Nabataeans, and they also had their churches and mausoleums named after their saints. For example, we have the uh, um, the 520, uh, 512 construction of the um, mausoleum of St. Sergius um, uh, but by the Jassanids, and we have the dating of the completion because it is inscribed on the walls in Arabic, Syria, sorry, in Syriac, in Arabic, and in Greek, right? So ultimately, where is that same instance in Mecca? We don't have any ancient church building in Mecca, implying that there were no Christians there. Even though the sources claim that uh, Warwick of Nafo was a Christian, I still don't know what community he belonged to. So when Muhammad was uttering these verses, people had no idea what he was speaking about. But the way the Quran is structured, it assumes that people are already familiar with the source text. That people already know who Moses is. How can you know who Moses is if you don't refer to the Torah? I don't know. But the Quran assumes with, with verbs like, has the story of Moses not reached you? Implying that he is giving them a summary of who Moses is. But because the Quran is lacking severely in detail, how will we ever even understand who Moses was, where he was born? How he even wound up in the wilderness, why he even went to Midian, which the Quran does mention actually in Surah 20, uh, why he even returned back, what his mission was, and why potentially he never even entered the promised land. We wouldn't know those details unless we refer to the Bible. But if we're having to refer to the Bible for those details, then it cannot be corrupted in the manner in which the Muslims say it is. Another example is when it comes to Jesus Christ. The Muslims will claim, for example, as, as a polemic, that they love Jesus Christ more than the Christians do. Why? Because they give him his proper place as a prophet of God, and they don't call him a, a curse as, as, uh, as Paul did, and they don't, they save him from the embarrassment of the crucifixion by Allah somehow disappearing him, and Muslims have been arguing about how so for the last thousand years, and still haven't come up with a conclusive answer. Now, when it comes to Jesus, in the Quran I have looked, there is nothing essentially to point you to any of the real teachings of Jesus Christ. Sure, he mentions that Allah is one, and that he is not Allah, and that he did not tell his disciples to worship uh, Mary and himself besides Allah, but all those things don't tell you the person of Christ. You miss the Beatitudes, you miss the Sermon on the Mount, you miss the feeding of the 5,000, you miss the, the uh, call to repentance, you miss the message of salvation, you miss the crucifixion, and the resurrection. Those things are not apparent in the Quran. And as a result, you're not getting the actual Jesus, you're getting a mutated form Jesus who is akin to the early heresies of Christendom. So if the Bible is corrupted, why is there so much information that the Muslims rely on? For example, where Christ was born, who his disciples were, that you will only find in the Christian scripture. If it is corrupted, then why lean on it to expose additional details about your one of your most liked prophets. Clearly, it is not corrupted because you're still making reference to it. So you cannot make reference to a corrupt text to form some truth about your own religion. So, 
the classical opinion regarding the corruption of the scriptures was more so corruption of interpretation. That is what the early Muslims taught about the Bible. That the, that the messaging was true, but the way in which Christians interpreted it was incorrect. And now, that is something more up to debate. We can certainly talk about that. But claiming outright that supposedly the entirety of the Old and New Testament are corrupt, apart from the parts that agree with the Quran, is still not answering the question as to why, even though there are parts that don't agree with the Quran, in the Gospels and the Torah, the, the Quran, or at least the exodus of the Quran, still make reference to them to extrapolate more about who these people are. So, you can't have it both ways. You cannot have your cake and eat it too. Either the Bible is the uncharged, inspired word of God, which is authoritative, as the Quran says, at least the Gospel and the Injil, or you are making reference to corrupted text each time I ask you Muslims, who was Jesus Christ? Where was he born and what did he teach? And then you start quoting things from the Bible that is asking from the Quran. You can't have it both ways. So, I say, you choose the way, the truth and the life. Not Allah, but Jesus Christ, the one who, without, you cannot attain salvation. The one who perfects you and doesn't just call you to be a slave to him. Being a slave to a random god is not going to get you into heaven. Many people are slaves to many other gods. What makes Allah special? Nothing. Allah and the Quran hang on the cold tales of the Bible. So if you're going to read an interpretation or a mutation of the Bible, I say read the actual original source text. And you will find how much richer, how much more fulfilling, elucidating it is than what is in the Quran. Which ultimately is text that relies on the Bible, which cannot be corrupted because neither the Quran says so, and the Muslims cannot refer to corrupted texts. So therefore, the Quran is wrong, and the Bible is correct. Praise God. Yes. So if the, if the Muslims come back to say that at the time of Muhammad, the Bible was was available, but then after that it got corrupted or got then how do you respond to that? Right, so in the Islamic context, and I pulled up the previous video that we had, there are two concepts, direct transmission and a free transmission. In the Islamic context, the transmission of the Quran, uh, the, the utterance of the Quran, or the recitation of the Quran, as well as the written format, is done in a controlled manner. People from the, the source, this is the core area that Islam originated in, are the ones who are going and actually teaching. Thank you. Other other uh, other uh, desperate communities or uh, civilizations about the Quran, and they are the ones who decided exactly what the Quran would compose of in the written and in the oral formats. You don't have that in Christianity. There was never a time in the early days of Christianity where we, where um, all of the uh, popes got together and decided what will go in and not go in the, into the Bible. It was done freely. So in the same time that you had a Bible in Ethiopia, you also had one in Egypt and in Libya and in Tunisia and in Rome and in Carthage. So there was no way for a singular person to have authority to go in all those directions and then give them a, a, a one unified source text or corrupt the source text and it's spread it all across the Christian world. So, even the fifth century, sorry? we can talk about that in a second. One, one, one moment. Uh, one, one, one moment. So, ultimately, if um, in the time of Muhammad, supposedly the gospel was there, but since then it has been lost, they would need to provide sufficient explanation as to how and which party went around the entire Christian world and somehow destroyed all the existing text that was in Rome, Carthage, wherever you may have it, and then replaced it with an Injil that, you know, takes away uh, the mention of Ahmed and uh, elevates Christ to the, to the position of God. But they can't provide that. But instead, what we have beforehand is multiple texts, like the Codex Sinaiticus, like the Codex Vaticanus, or even the, the uh, Diatessaron of Tatian, or even the first century uh, Didache that mention Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as authoritative. So if we have that far before Islam ever rolled around the corner, how then can the Islamic claim that in the Muhammad's time the Gospel and the Torah were there, but subsequently afterwards, somehow, somebody corrupted them, how can I hold water? <laughs>